and good evening, and welcome to the story behind the story. This evening is somewhat unique because we're going to be telling you a story of a legend that still exists. I have a special guest, Roger Hardy. You're familiar with Roger because he has been on television. You viewed him in his exploits in the Atlantic and many of the evasions in the Merchant Marine. And so it is always my pleasure to introduce to you Roger Hardy and the prologue to a legend. Thank you, Good Jack. Evening, Roger. Good to see you again. Throughout the years in World War II, a name keep, kept cropping up no matter where you were, and that name was Kilroy. Now this Kilroy fellow was every place where everybody hadn't been, and he got there before anybody else ever arrived. Now Kilroy was a shipyard rivet inspector, and he worked in the Four River Shipyard in Massachusetts. Now his job as a shipyard inspector was to go through the hull of the ship as it was being assembled and determine whether or not all the rivets were in their proper location and whether the, and the number of rivets that the riveteurs had installed were actually in place. And once he had done that, uh, Jack, he, uh, he would put a chalk mark on them. And it was usually a waxy type chalk, something that wouldn't, that he could carry around because he was in areas that it was difficult to carry paint, et cetera. And after he went through and checked his uh, riveter's work and his shift ended, another fellow would take over. And uh, that fellow would take and uh, go through again and recount the rivets because the riveters in their zeal to get paid more money had wiped all the marks off that uh, Kilroy had placed in them. Now, uh, through the war, there were various times that I had run into Kilroy, and, and uh, he had made his presence known every place that I went except for one. And he had a special logo. And in order to make sure that his presence was known in the one place that I had never found his logo, which was Archangels Russia, I decided to, being a wise guy, that I would put this logo all around the countryside of, or any place I went. And that's what I did. And it later got me in a little bit of difficulty with the security force. But uh, Mr. Kilroy came into prominence uh, because of his ability to appear almost any place at any time before anybody else had arrived there. And after the war ended, uh, the uh, men and women returning from uh, uh, the various areas of the world uh, told their story and there was a, a company called the American Transit Association and it had a radio program, Speak to America, and they decided that they were going to find out who the real Kiroi was and whether or not he was actually a fictitious member or whether he was just uh, uh, somebody that had worked around and had gotten his name out into the general public. And that's where we started. You know, you mentioned earlier relative to uh, your trip to Russia. I wondered if you might sit back and tell us about uh, sailing to Archangel and what had happened to you because of Kilroy. Yeah. Well, all during the war, I was sailed to many countries and many places. And as the war near Europe was winding down, I had applied for and was accepted into the uh, United States Maritime uh, Officers Training School to uh, become certified in uh, celestial navigation. And uh, 
That was in Fort Trumbull in New London, Connecticut, Jack. And we, uh, it was part of the Coast Guard Academy, actually, and they divided a piece of it off and uh, set it up for uh, young merchant seamen to become ship's officers, and that's where I went through. And I, uh, I uh, entered that in December of 44, and uh, graduated in May of 45, and during that time, of course, President Roosevelt had passed on, and uh, it changed things dramatically. It also, the war had actually ended, and prior to that, that was the last trip I had ever made under wartime, uh, wartime conditions as a uh, mariner. And uh, after I graduated from the Fort Trumbull and, uh, and uh, made, uh, passed all their required uh, subjects, I uh, sat before the U.S. Coast Guard and uh, took their examination to become a third mate aboard uh, ocean-going vessels, and my license qualified me to sail on any ship of any gross tonnage of any waters in the world. It was probably the pinnacle of my seafaring career, and I was quite proud of doing that. Uh, later on, in the uh, after I graduated from the maritime school, I was uh, assigned to a ship in. Uh, Bush Terminal, I think it was, in Brooklyn, New York, and uh, they uh, sent us off with supplies to France, which was a load of coal, of all things, and we uh, sailed to the southern part of France, and it was in the Barren Sea. It was in the part of France that was never invaded, and uh, everything was fairly intact because the Germans had to abandon it, except for the dock area. and. Uh, we uh, docked the ship there, and they decided that they were going to unload it with buckets, uh, which were equivalent to about two gallons, and one at a time, and one bucket to each hold. And I figured it was going to take a month of Sundays to get unloaded the way they were going. I complained to the skipper about it, and he contacted the American embassy in France, or in Paris at that time, and they sent down a professional group, probably from their army, and they managed to get the ship unloaded in due course. It was quite an experience. We were there for about seven, eight weeks before they really started to unload the ship. And of course, I had just gotten married before that, and I figured I had better things to do at home than to hang around French, uh, for French women, that was for sure. Uh, later on, when they finished uh, unloading the ship, uh, uh, we were made seaworthy and were told to return to uh, the East Coast of the United States where they would issue instructions for us to uh, receive a cargo someplace and, and we would be assigned a designation to bring supplies back to Europe. Uh, the people in Europe at that time were starving because they had all their infrastructure was down, the roads were destroyed, the bridges, and they had no agriculture or anything else. And they were, de they were dependent on the Americans to bring them supplies, and we did. We went to. Germany and Belgium and England, of course, they weren't as bad off as the rest of them, but uh, in so doing, uh, uh, we uh, unloaded in various countries, and uh, then we were, uh, we were issued orders to uh, uh, sail again, and uh, our next destination was Russia. Well, I had made or attempted to make one trip up there, which proved to be a mitigating disaster because I never got beyond the Arctic Circle. They blew us out of the water. And the skipper, when we, uh, we were ordered up to Glasgow to uh, take on supplies for our northern voyage, and the skipper got there and he refused to go to Russia. And I later discovered that the reason for it was that he had made an earlier trip to Russia, and like I, the ship I was on was sunk, and only in that particular instance the crew was able to get off, or at least part of them, on into lifeboats. And when they were in the lifeboats, the German submarine surfaced, and they put a machine gun on the Koning Tower and strafed the crew. Oh, boy. And needless to say, they suffered tremendously uh, because of it, and it was also wintertime, and they were cold, and the skipper was one of the three or four that survived, and that experience was so traumatic for him that he 
just didn't want to be sailing to Russia again, and they refused to. And they assigned us uh, a new uh, a skipper who was actually a Navy commander, and he was uh, being sent home aboard our ship, actually, and he was on his way to be discharged in, uh, out of the service in Boston, but he agreed to take the command of the ship, and we went up to uh, Archangels. And when we got up to uh, north of, the, of uh, Norway, we headed easterly into the White Sea, and at the entrance of the White Sea, the ship was uh, ordered to stop dead in the water, and they brought a Russian pilot aboard. And that pilot was a very heavy-set woman, and she, was a, she wasn't very friendly to the crew, and at that moment, they locked down all our navigation equipment took away our sextants. I had a personal sextant that I bought in England <clears throat> and uh, took over the complete command of the ship. We had nothing to say about it when they sail as, uh, sailing towards Archangels down the White Sea. Now when we got to uh, Archangels, they didn't move us into the dock, Jack. They, uh, they put us in Anchorage and Later on in that day, uh, the so-called Russian security force came aboard and they lined the whole crew up from skipper on down to the, the mess boy in the stewards department on the weather deck or near number four and five hole while they went through the ship and searched for God only knows what. I, but, but they spent about an hour and a half doing that and they finally released us and, and we took command of the ship again and they towed us back and we were... Uh, moved to the docks in, uh, in Archangels. Now, the, <clears throat> the, the ship was uh, assigned a cargo of uh, fresh-cut lumber. That was about the only export they had at that time. And we were going to be there for several weeks because they, as they cut the lumber they would out of the forest, they would move it to the dock and then they would load it on board piece by piece. Uh, they used the ship's equipment to load it. And in the meantime, uh, the crew was divided up into uh, three segments. One segment of the crew had uh, liberty. A third segment of the crew operated the ship. And the, uh, the other segment of the crew, uh, well, I should say, they operated the ship during the daylight hours. The other segment of the crew operated the ship in, in the, during the evening. And we had an opportunity to uh, go ashore and, and spend some time with the populace in Russia, which was rather interesting. And when I, my turn came to have Liberty ashore, because we had to take a ferry boat, which was because the docks were approximately 20 miles away from the city proper, if that's what you could call it. At that time, the city was built on corduroy roads, which were logs laid over the tundra, which never thawed out and gravel on top of it and, and during the cold months, which was about 90% of the year from, from my estimation, the ground was hard. And during the brief thaw they had, it turned to nothing but a quagmire and that's when everything kind of stopped. But while I was there, I noticed that no place that I observe a sign about Kilroy. And I said, gee, you know, I've got to introduce the populace here to this chap, whomever he may be. So I started putting his logo, Kilroy was here, with a little symbol, uh, which you have displayed on the desk here, Jack, in the frame. And uh, that was the symbol that I drew every place I went. First place, of course, was the latrine, I guess. And, and on the, so I guess I did one on the ferry boat and, of course, in the, in the hotels, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, as I was uh, wandering around the city uh, looking uh, over the damage that had been created during the war, uh, this young woman came up to me and started chatting. And she was most unusual. She was out of place the way she was dressed, nice stockings, blonde hair, makeup, etc. And uh, we had an interesting conversation. She told me of the experiences she went through during the war. Uh, while she was there, and, and, and I told her of some of the experiences that I'd had of trying to make it to Russia and in the Mediterranean and all of it. And it, um, it finally came to the point, I was wondering what she, why, why she was so attracted to my particular presence, and she finally came out with it. And 
she let me know in no uncertain terms that she actually was a member of the security force. And I said, oh, first of all, what am I up to now? I changed the wording a little bit there. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, what's she going to have to ask me? And she said, you know, she said, the purser on your ship, who was the ch business administrator and also the medical officer, if you want to call it that, was in charge of keeping records of the crew and, and uh, all about the finances and everything. And he had given the security force a list of all the personnel on the ship and their positions and what they did. And she told me that. She said, there's only one problem. She said, there's one name that keeps cropping up around and seems to appear every time you've, someplace you've been in the city. And I said, well, what name is that? And she said, Kilroy. And I said, oh, brother, now I'm in real trouble. She knows who, I, who did <laughs> what. And I, and I said, you know, Kilroy, he's just a, he's a, he's a pr fictitious person that's been every place. And I said, you didn't have him up here, and I've got to introduce him to you. She said, well, she said, that may well be, she says, but my boss is the security people would like to talk to you about it. Said, well, what can I do? Sure, you know, I'm in the middle of no place and mm -hmm. I don't, nobody's Understand. around, none of my buddies yeah. or anything. I said, lead on. So she took me to a building that rather nondescript and, uh, and we kept chatting about her personal life, et cetera. And, and when we got to this building, it was, it was mostly poured concrete and, and it was a large room and off to one side of the room was a desk, just an old metal desk with a comfortable chair and sitting in the chair was a security officer in his uniform and ribbons and everything. And off to one side, off to my right and off to her right was a soldier with a machine gun. I said, they're not going to let me run out of here, that's for sure. <laughs> I would think so. At any rate, and, and uh, they started talking and uh, the, the, uh, they put two chairs in front of the desk and uh, the young lady suggested that we be seated. Well, what else am I going to do? <laughs> Refuse and, and not? And I said, well, I might as well be as comfortable as I can. And they proceeded. And they were asking me questions. Who's Kilroy? Where'd he come from? Where'd he live? How old is he? What was his position on the ship? And I kept telling them over and over and over, he's fictitious. He's been, he's every place at once, all over the world. You'll find him on every packaging that, that, that's opened up, whether it's a bomber or a bombs or rifles or ammunition. His name is always there. And when you go ashore someplace, you will find a sign that says, Curie was here. Sometimes he said, way before you were. And they wouldn't accept that for an answer. And this went on for two and a half hours. I'm beginning to get a little exasperated, but seeing that soldier over there with a machine gun, I wasn't going to get fresh. I wouldn't think so. So, you know, and the, and the soldier, you could see him shifting a little bit. You know, he's getting kind of uneasy standing at attention there for two and a half hours. And finally, he stepped forward in the very best military fashion, stood at attention and saluted his superior and said, sir, I don't mean to interrupt, but he said, I can answer your question. And I said, oh, thank goodness for this guy. <laughs> I don't know where he's been, but I'm going to buy him a beer when it's all done. <laughs> at any rate, he, he came forward and he said, I was on the Eastern Front fighting the Germans. And he said, these merchant mariners brought us supplies up through mermen and archangels, and they were shipped to the front, and they were usually still in their carton. And he said, I opened up one of these cartons one time. It, was, it, it contained a, a transmission or an engine or something we needed for one of the trucks that we'd been using. And it, there was a sign that said, Curie was here, and he packaged this. And he said, I became real curious. And he said, lo and behold, I talked to some of the other guys that I'd been in the front with, and they said, yeah, we've seen the same thing. Who's Kilroy? Nobody ever told him, and nobody found out. And they said, we came to the conclusion, like this, uh, this officer here, because I was the third mate and, and I, I had been commissioned in the maritime sir. He said, this officer's telling us as it is. He's fictitious. We don't know who he is, and he's every place at once. 
And with that, the, the officer kind of tilted his head back and said, and in Russian, the lady was interpreting all the time to me, and he gave up and says, I give up. He said, all right. He says, I'm satisfied. So with that, we took a little break. I needed to go to the head very bad at that moment because I had had a few beers beforehand. And uh, we kind of stood around for a while, and they said to the lady, well, you could, you could go back to the center of the city now, wherever that may have been. It wasn't a, too long a walk. <laughs> At any rate, after that was all uh, over with, uh, we went back and, and uh, wandered around again, and she stuck with me because she was looking for a free meal and whatever, so we included her in the crowd. When, and she said, well, I think the crew is in the hotel down the line, and you'll probably find them there. And, and, and sure enough, they were there, and she stuck around. We had something to eat, and she, was, she could drink, I'll tell you that. She could put it away faster than any man that I ever saw. And I said, well, you know, that was cheap enough to get out of it that way. So Very true. <laughs> at any rate, she, uh, she stayed with us for a while, and then she finally had gave up. And, and uh, she said, uh, well, I've got to move along. And she said, would you please do me a favor? Don't sign any more Kilroys around. She says, I, I, I couldn't put up with another day like this. She says, it's been an unusual one. She said, I don't want to go through it again. Well, after she'd left, and we hung around for a couple more hours and had a, you know, and just enjoyed camaraderie, and we talked to some of the Russians there that could, that could speak a little English. They'd learned it in the, the in, when we were in North Ar Africa, the Arabs would say arms, arms, and the Russians had another word for it, and uh, I knew what they meant. They were looking for money and everything. And it came time that we were, the ferry boat was headed back to the ship, and we needed to, uh, needed to move on. And I reached in my pocket to get my wallet to pay for my share, and lo and behold, no wallet. Somebody had ripped it off or swiped it. Probably the little kids in the street, they were hanging around you like an ant in, the, in a honey jar. And uh, I said, what the heck am I going to do now? i got to pay for my share of the meal. So I said to the guys, and you guys got any extra money? And they said, because they think you'd loan me until they get back to the ship. And they said, I ain't got any money. I'm nearly broke myself. And you know, after seeing how they'd wind and dined the locals, I knew they weren't lying. And just at that moment, another lady stepped forward. I don't know where they get all these English-speaking women, but she, she spoke some English, not as well as the one that first in, uh, connected to me. And she said, I speak a little Yankee. She said, can I help you? And I said, oh, yeah. And I told her the story. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so she went over and talked to the proprietor, who by this time was visibly upset. And I didn't know if he had a dagger or a pistol on his hip or whatever. And I wasn't <laughs> about to argue with him. I just wanted to get the hell out of there, if you pardon the <laughs> expression. And uh, <clears throat> she said, well, he's been watch he's looking at my watch. And he said uh, he would settle for the watch. If I settled a bill that I owed him for the watch, I said, oh, that's fine. And I, that was a good deal for me because little be known to him, I had paid the outlandish price of $19.95 in Times Square <laughs> just before <laughs> I took the ship because I needed something to keep time by, uh. not for navigation, but for just the general purposes. So I handed him the watch. He shook hands, and I bailed out of there as fast as I could to the ferry boat. And... Uh, we finally made it back. You know, we had to wait an hour or two at the ferry before everybody got on board and in one state of inebriation to another. And uh, some of them needed to be lugged aboard. And uh, we took off and headed back for the docks. And when we got there, we went about our normal uh, duties of uh, operating the ship and preparing it for the open sea because the lumber had pretty much been loaded on and was being lashed down in vent of inclement weather. And uh, the following day, just as we were about to raise the gangplank and secure that for the sea and the tugboats had already made fast to us, ready to tow us away from the dock, a courier came up on a motorcycle and 
It was an Indian motorcycle made in the United States. I'm surprised Whoa. Kilroy didn't have a sign on that. <laughs> <clears throat> and the courier came on board ship and went up to the skipper and slowed it and everything and handed him a box. The skipper opened the box. Lo and behold, in that box was my wallet. And the skipper oh. gave it back to me. He said, oh, geez, that, they're really honest people up here. Yeah, yeah. And I opened the wallet up, no money, no pictures. My ID for the identification with the Coast Guard and stuff was in there. It was in bad shape. It was kind of muddy. But in the money compartment was a note written in perfect English. And what do you think it said? Kilroy was here. <laughs> and that's my trip to Russia. It was quite an experience, and I'll never forget it as long as I live. It had a happy ending that time. Certainly yeah, understandable. So, yeah. <laughs> Certainly understandable. But uh, it, it, the, talking to that woman and hearing of some of the experiences that she related to me, it, it was it was very informative, and she was I'm she had sure gone through was. a lot. And uh, you know, Jack, I know you had a lot of uh, experiences in your. Uh, travels through the South Pacific with Kilroy, and you know, he was all over the place. I'm sure you've got something that you could tell us about. That I do. Because we all know that Kilroy was a legend. So let's start at Pearl Harbor. On the East Gate, as you drive through the circle, there's a sign. And that sign reads, Kilroy was here. What else? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move on to the South Pacific Islands, Guadalcanal, Tarawa, Anahuitoc, Bougainville, Iwo Jima. Now those islands were secure. They had fought very hard for them, and now they were part of the United States, as we all know. But there were ships at anchor out around the island, and uh, at that time, the island being secured, uh, they built up a little area for men on the ships to come ashore and for an R&R, &R, to relax. And with that, uh, they had set up a little bar and beer for the men that came ashore. A nectar of life. But on each one of those areas that have the bar, and they called it Duffy's Tavern throughout the Pacific. One thing in particular, when you came ashore, I'll give you odds, what did you see? Kilroy was here. Kilroy was here. It was noted throughout the Pacific. The island of Tinian is where they house the B. 29s, the big bombers. Those bombers were loaded with 500 pound bombs destined for Japan. And so, consequently, and occasionally, when those bombs were being loaded, there would be some scribbling on the bomb. One in particular, and it's so stated on the bomb, greetings from Kilroy. <laughs> <laughs> As I said, Kilroy became really a byword. Let's move on to the island of Guam. As we all know, the command of the Pacific was under the leadership of Admiral Nimitz. Since a lot of the area of the Pacific was secured, he wanted to move operations. So he moved his operations to Guam. Now, Guam was equipped with many, many, many articles and areas and troops for the purpose of the invasion of Japan. And his headquarters was at, at Aganya in Guam. And so, Admiral Nimitz and his staff went to Aganya. And when they opened that large building, what do you think they saw? Kilroy, Kilroy was here. <clears throat> Okinawa. That was a tough battle in oh, 1945. Yeah. 
but the island then was secured. And when it was secured, uh, you went ashore and you went up to what they call Rikong, which is up on a hill. And up there was a sign. And that sign said, Kilroy was here. This spread all over oh, yeah. the Pacific. Well, let's move into Japan. As we all know, in 1945, there were two large bombs dropped. The atomic bombs, one in Hiroshima, the other in Nagasaki. The 1st Cavalry, United States Army, because Japan had signed unconditional surrender, had uh, taken over. They were the police of Japan at that time. But between Yokohama and Tokyo, there is a stadium. And they named that stadium Ernie Pyle. For Ernie Pyle was not, it was noted in the Pacific, he was noted in the Atlantic for his writings. And so they dedicated that stadium to him. And then as you went into Tokyo, into certain areas at the Kushu Temple, there was a sign. <laughs> Kilroy was here. In 1948, I was aboard the General H.F. Hodges, destined for South Korea. We were going to Enchon. We dropped the anchor in Enchon, and I had the privilege of going ashore. And I went up to Kempo. At Kempo, I met the provost marshal. And we talked and chatted about the war. And he, in turn, said, oh, would you like to see a little bit of Seoul? Now, this is before the Korean War. And I said, well, of course. So we climbed in the jeep over that bridge we went, and we looked around in Seoul, and then up on the hill. And on the hill is a divided factor, and it still exists. It's a military zone. North Korea, the troops guard on one side, and then on the other, the American troops. But in the middle of these two, guess who? Words really are inadequate to that legend, but on that rock, Kilroy was here. Situations in the Pacific, it was standard procedure to know that he was about. Now, Roger, I'd like to get, turn it back to you regarding Kilroy is alive and well. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> His name was so prominent and so spread around the world, as you have alluded to, and so have I, and that the American Transit Association, through their radio program, Speak to America, they sponsored a nationwide contest to see and find out if there was a real Kilroy. And they offered a prize. And the prize was a real trolley car, believe it or not. I don't, I don't know where it was or how they were going to get a hold of it, but it was. And they offered it to any person that could prove that he was actually Kilroy. And they had almost 40 men come forward and to try to say that they were Kilroy. And there was only one man that stood the test of time and circumstances and his name was James, James Kilroy, and he was a man that worked in the, in the shipyards in Fall River. And uh, he had evidence of his true identity. Now, uh, while he was working in the shipyard uh, there, as I said before, he, was, he inspected rivets that were installed by the various uh, men, and, and he would count them, and they got paid according to the number of rivets that they had installed in, in the hull, and he made sure that there were the work was done properly, and after he was done, uh, he put his mark on there. And it, it used to be just a check mark with a sign saying Kilroy was here. Well, uh, he would, of course, he had to have some time off, and I think the shifts then were 12 hours long, and he would have a, 
uh, another person would come in and uh, to, to assist him in his off time, and, and they, again, they would count the rivets. But in the interim, between the two covering each other's position, the rivets would go in there with rags and wipe all those marks right off. And the, so the second shift inspector would go through and he'd count the same rivets over and over again, and by golly, they were getting double pay. And of course, the foreman of this group began to realize that these men were making a, a lot more money than the others in the yard, and, and he called Kilroy, James Kilroy, in, uh, the inspector, the head inspector, and said, you, you gotta find out what's going on here. He said, we're spending way too much money for the same amount of work. And uh, so uh, Kilroy dis was in issued the instructions to go find out and come back with a report. Now, a lot of those spaces in the ships were hard to get at, so you couldn't really crawl around with a paint can and use permanent marks of any type because it was too tight. So Kilroy, uh, uh, he stuck to his waxy chalk marks, and, uh, and uh, he added uh, at that time, in, the, in addition to his chalk marks, he added the message that Kilroy was here, and that's where it came from all about. And... Uh, and he put it down there in king size letters and so forth. And, and, uh, and uh, part of the message was he drew a little sketch, which was a, a funny looking geek looking over a fence. And you've got a depiction of it right here in the center of council. And with that, it became too much work for the riveters to try to wipe all that out. And so from then on in, the count went down and things uh, went uh, along as normal. Now, normally, um, uh, as they were constructing the ships, uh, these areas would get painted. And uh, because of the, the war, the ships were being built so fast, uh, they, they didn't get a chance to paint over those marks. So the, the, consequently, the troops and men that were boarding these ships uh, when they were sent to sea would see this sign, Kilroy was here with this little depiction of his, uh, of his, uh, of his being there. Now, they, uh, these were unfortunate troops in the eyes of many, and it was a complete mystery to all of them that, uh, that some jerk named Kilroy was was uh, had been there before them and was probably someplace overseas and they carried on the tradition. So no matter where they went, they made the signs. And it is said that in some places that it was, uh, uh, you know, that the signs were placed on uh, on the beaches before the invading forces got there. And, and uh, later on, they said they found it up on top of Mount Everest and uh, on the undersides of the Arch de Triumph. And uh, uh, it's claimed that's even on the dust of the moon. That's stretching it a bit, but it may be. You know, you never know with Kilroy. And uh, as time went by, the legend kept growing. And as the war went on and the legend grew, and underwater demolition teams would uh, call frogmen in those days. It's, it's called sea beasts today. And, and uh, they sneak ashore in Jap-held islands to... Uh, get the lay of the land for the invasion forces, looking at topography, et cetera. And uh, they, uh, they had found that presumably they were the first GIs there, but on, on occasion they found a sign already there that said Kilroy was here. Now how that happened to be, nobody knows, but it, it's suspected that they put the sign up themselves. And they said that the enemy troops were so frustrated that when they'd see the signs wherever they were, they would paint over them. I would rather suspect that he'd yank them out of the ground, but that's the story. Um, later on in the war, and the wars being fought successfully on all fronts, uh, the uh, President of the United States and, and uh, Churchill from England and Stalin from Russia had a meeting it was at the post, called the Postan Conference. And in preparation for the, the dignitaries of the, each country to be there, it was out in the boondocks, of course, the people that had set up the camp for them built an outhouse. And it was a very exclusive outhouse, to say the least. And the first one, I guess, to use it was Stalin. 
And when he came out, he said to his aide in Russian, who's Kilroy? Because what they had done is they had a sign inside, Kilroy was here. <laughs> <laughs> now, identifying the real Kilroy, as previously stated, was for 40 men came forward, and all but one was eventually eliminated as, uh, by the investigating committee, and his name was James Kilroy. And as part of the procedure, Kilroy was asked to prove, provide proof of his identity. Now, he brought along officials from the shipyard, and he brought along some of the workmen, and that proved his identity, that he really was Kilroy. Now, he was from Halifax, Massachusetts, and uh, he, uh, he won the trolley car. Wow. And, <laughs> and they shipped the trolley car to his property, and he put it on the front yard of his house. And in so doing, he set it up as a playhouse for all the neighborhood kids. And that was the story of Kilroy and how they found out who he really was. And he is actually a real person. Now, I, I know there's some, uh, you have some other comments here about the proof of the legend, Jack. I, that I do. Yeah. You know, a legend of this nature, Kilroy was considered, and still is, an icon. You know, this is the recorded history of Kilroy and how he became a legend throughout the world through World War II. His fame continues on into other conflicts, including Korean, Vietnam, Iraq, and Afghanistan war. A likeness of the logo depicting Kilroy as he appeared in the untold number of places throughout the world may be viewed right here at the anchor desk. It's a story behind a story, a legend that still continues. A chuckle here and there, but a legend. And in closing, I wish to take an opportunity to thank Roger for putting together this program that deals with a legend, Kilroy. Thank you, Roger, and it's a fun well, pleasure. Thank you, Jack, for the opportunity. I would like to add one more comment, if I may. Please. <clears throat> and that is that I am trying to locate the family of Kilroy where they lived at the time in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And I'd like to make them aware of this program. And if possible, get their comments about their dad, their uncle, their grandfather, whatever the case may be, for a future uh, maybe taping into this program. And uh, I think that would be quite an asset to them. And I would like to, if we are able to contact them, to make them uh, uh, a gift of one of the DVDs that's been produced. Thank you again, I Jack. I really agree, and thank you, Roger. Once again, it's been a pleasure and a privilege. It brings to the end of the story behind the story of a legend. Until we meet again, Kilroy was here. Good night. Production support provided by Medfield.tv access to our community.